Leanne Cullen Unsworth, please join me. And um, I'll tell you what, why don't you grab that one there and our ones are over this way. So bear with us because um, Leanne has had such a hectic conference. You have a little bit of a sore throat, don't you? Yeah, I'm struggling oh, a little bit. Oh, that's pretty good. You, 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 can, you hear, can you hear Leanne? <laughs> you, we, can, you, we can hear you. Uh, so uh, Leanne runs, uh, is the chief executive of Project Seagrass. Um, so I just want to do a little thing here. Everyone stick your hand up. Everyone stick your hand up. I can see people, like, stick your hand up. There's lots of people on their phones, right? Okay. Um, drop your hand if you don't know what seagrass is. Okay. All right. So, uh, so we've got, I think we've got good. Yeah. So, Leanne, what's seagrass? It's a good start point. Yeah. Um, so, seagrass is a plant. Um, it's not a seaweed. It's not a seaweed. Okay. No, it's very right. different. It's a complex plant. It's very similar to a terrestrial grass. So it's a flowering plant. So it seeds, um, flowers, produces seeds and self-seeds. Yep. Um, and where you have healthy environment, this plant can create dense, vast meadows across the seabed. And it's that complex habitat then that supports enormous biodiversity. Yep. Um, invertebrate and fish and packs down carbon and can keep it packed under there. It cycles nutrients. Um, it provides livelihoods, lots of different reasons. It's, it provides a cultural connection. Um, it's, it's just an absolutely incredible habitat. Yep. And it's a global resource. So um, the only continent you don't find it on currently is Antarctica. Yep. But it's every other continent. Currently. Currently, who knows? We might, we might be popping up there soon. Um, but yeah, everywhere else across the globe, it's a global resource. So, so let's just kind of um, pull that apart a little bit. In, in terms of um, biodiversity, compared to other marine habitats, how important is seagrass? It is incredibly important. Compared to bare sand now, um, a single hectare of seagrass, you're looking at 28,000 invertebrates and around 8,000 fish in that single hectare. So it supports huge diversity. And that, that diversity is significant. I mean, I mean if, nothing, you know, if nothing else, this is why we should be protecting seagrass. It's that biodiversity value. No biodiversity, no life on the planet. That's, that's it. This is what we need to be focusing on. No biodiversity, no life. Nail on the head. In terms of carbon, ca capacity to trap carbon compared to other forms of marine habitats, how important is seagrass? It's very important. Um, I am not going to put a figure on it right now because the estimates are very varied right now. Yeah. We know it's significant and where you have got a dense healthy, very old seagrass meadow like um, Posidonia in Shark Bay in Australia. That's like thousands of years old. That has got an extremely high carbon sequestration and storage value. Um, but where you've got new meadows, it's going to take quite a long time yeah. for a new or a sparse meadow to get up to scratch and hit, hit that. So it's hugely varied. There's a lot of research going on right now into the carbon value of different seagrass meadows in different locations across the globe. Another important thing is that we need to also be thinking about the overall gaseous exchange within a seagrass meadow because in an unhealthy environment with poor water quality, you could end up with net emission of greenhouse gases through the um, NOx emissions, methane. Right, well. so we've got to think about both it's sides. It's the whole picture. It needs to be a healthy environment. Okay, so another bit of context. You mentioned culture and coastal communities. How important is seagrass compared to other marine habitats in terms of culture? Yeah. Again, I mean, I'm, I'm not... Seagrass is my thing. You, you kind of like it's, seagrass, it's don't my, you? It's my background. <laughs> I'm not just in any other marine environment. And ultimately, what we need is a connected, healthy seascape with all of these environments, these different habitats. Healthy. But we're going to talk about seagrass. But seagrass, though, <laughs> is super cool. Um, and everywhere across its global range, from you know developing areas to very developed areas, there is you see this cultural connection mm. to this habitat. I've worked with Bajo communities in Indonesia where um, families have lost one of the parents, and it provides this access to a resource 
for food, but then also these communities don't want to be far away from that meadow um, because they have grown up with that. That is their life. It's, it is that sense of belonging and it belongs to the seagrass meadow. Mm. And then in, in the UK, I've spoken to um, older generation who thankfully still remember a time when we had seagrass in certain areas um, and they're driven to help us do our work because they want their grandchildren to have that same connection you know they used to shrimp fish with their grandparents in a seagrass meadow they're not catching huge amounts that's a cultural connection or they saw seahorses in a seagrass meadow and they want their grandchildren to see that same thing and experience that and, and it's those things that are absolutely key, that we need those memories. So I'm gonna, we're going to come on to the work that you are doing in a moment. Um, one more question before we get there. Uh, and I mentioned a UK stat at the beginning when we first got together. What has happened to our seagrass? <laughs> what has happened? Um, globally, we have lost huge amounts of our seagrass um, the estimates vary but you know we're, we're talking about it's still in decline for significant soccer field a minute kind of numbers it's, like, it's psh, insane I mean, it's, as we speak um, it's... yeah yeah it is being lost um, there was widespread loss across Europe lost 50% of its seagrass in the 1930s and it was largely attributed to a wasting disease within the seagrass, but it coincided with industrialization and poor water quality. And that has been a significant imp- and remains one of the most significant impacts on seagrass meadows. So, but also, you know, coastal development, um, anchor scouring, uh, mooring scouring, those sorts of things, any kind of physical um, impact, mm-hmm. prop damage, um, the, all of those things will impact seagrass. The way, where we have got an opportunity now to put seagrass back is in those areas where the water quality has improved mm-hmm. somewhat, but there's still vast areas that might be suitable, but we're not going to try until the water quality is improved just a, a bit more to give seeds and seedlings a bit and, more of a chance to grow. And you mentioned something very important there because if you don't fix the water quality, then you can't fix the seagrass. Yes. Yeah. Right, so we've done the background, we've done the context, we've done how bad things have got, what are you doing to fix it? Okay, so we're, we're a grassroots organization. Um, so what you did there? We came, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. my seagrass seed was planted when um, oh. I was doing my PhD right. uh, in? research in Indonesia, actually. Okay. Um, and I, I fell into seagrass really accidentally because I went, um, my research was looking at marine resource use patterns just broadly yeah. and I had the assumption that people would be dependent on um, coral reefs and mangroves that didn't really consider seagrass right. but actually the highest dependence locally was on seagrass meadows for cultural fulfilment um, access to resource um, backup livelihood access to financing through collections mm-hmm. um, and so then I've worked on seagrass in different places around the world and everywhere is the same case. There is this level of dependence, cultural connection to this incredible habitat. But at the same time, there are lots of people still, that, or 20 years ago, no one was really talking about seagrass. There are a few excellent researchers starting to, to pick up on it. Um, but then seagrass, Project Seagrass was born from uh, that recognition of a need to raise awareness really about this global resource that was being ignored it was seagrass has been referred to as the ugly duckling of the marine environment right. because it, you know it's not got that same appeal as a as a coral to some it, people yeah. it hasn't got the same appeal as a coral but to coral you reef. seagrass is beautiful you just need to sit for a few minutes in a seagrass meadow immersed and looked down and you're going to see in the UK you're going to see pipefish you're going to see baby place you might see a seahorse you know you're going to see hermit crabs and green crabs there is so much life mm. but you've got to be a bit more patient mm. so um, most of your work is in the in the UK but you're you're what t- so tell no, us tell us about tell us about your you know your I, I want to go into that seagrass meadow where you are working tell, tell take me there now Describe what it looks like, but what the intervention is, what the work okay. you are doing with the local community to, you, to secure You could them. pick a coastline pretty much anywhere in the world and find a sheltered bay, and there will be some seagrass, hopefully. I mean, the decline's massive and it's patchy across its range, but you will be able to find it. Um, where we're doing restoration work on the ground, that's UK-based for us. Yeah. So we've got big restoration projects on the south coast of England, 
um, south coast of Wales, north Wales coast on the Slane Peninsula, um, and in the Firth of Forth in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, my particular favourite spot is the Slane Peninsula in North Wales, right. and there we are working. We, we're monitoring an existing meadow that is absolutely outstanding. This is a UK meadow. The sun shines, you're down there, the water's clear, it's full of life. It's, we need people to understand that it's there, it's right there. Even on our doorstep, you can find a beautiful meadow. Um, but that meadow is also a donor meadow for us. So it's very healthy reproductively, and we um, harvest wild seed from that meadow to help elsewhere. us elsewhere restore. So we are planting across the Lean Peninsula um, in different sites at the moment. A lot of the work we're doing right now is trials with different methods. Um, so the, the science for seagrass restoration, for marine restoration, generally lags behind that of terrestrial restoration. But there's a lot for us to do. Um, so we're trialling different methods. Is, is, is marine, uh, I mean, how different is it to terrestrial uh, um, propagation? It's, it's much more complex. I mean, it's really, everything's harder when you're working in a saltwater environment, I think. Um, but we're looking at, it, for, for seagrass, if we get germination between 5 to 10%, we are super, super excited about that. Right. Um, and I believe if you get less than 80% in a terrestrial environment, it's a okay. bit disappointing. Okay. Um, but we're, so we're, it's hard. we're working it is, it's on harder. that. It's hard. It's hard. Um, and restoration's not the easy solution. You know, it's protection's the best thing we can do for... And we need that net gain. We need the protection and we need to bring back. Um, but we're doing that, and we're, we're working on the so, science so to improve so, so, so those methods. So restoration, um, restoration is typically uh, uh, protect, cultivate, and, and, and sow and spread. Yeah. In, in, yeah. And, and can you take uh, seedling, seedlings? Seeds, seedlings. Correct terminology? Small plants. Small seedlings. plants, small things. <laughs> can you take them from one place to another, or do you, I mean, what kind of variation... Yeah. Is there, what do you need to be careful about? You, you cannot. <laughs> um, and where we're working around the UK, there's very strict licensing um, procedures that we've got to go through. We have to have a marine license to plant. Right. And we can't just take seeds from Orkney and go and plant them in South Wales. Right. And there are different genetic variations of the same seagrass species. Yep. Um, so there, there are rules that need to be followed. And we need to be careful about biosecurity and you know, the transfer of, of different organisms. So, so, so if that is recovery in a sense, um, preservation is harder? Preservation is harder to get funding for. Right. Um, but I think... And why is that? I don't know. It's tangible, isn't it? You can put a price on a seed and put a certain number of seeds in right. a certain area of the seabed and then, you know, you've got something. It's not that simple because you, you're not planting a meadow. You're putting that seed in, giving it its best chance to, to grow into a, a seedling and then a plant and then, you know, spread laterally. Um, but then you need to also go back and reinforce annually this restoration is a long process right. doesn't it's just not you don't one, plant once one and you've done it no you do not you don't plant a hectare you have to keep going back yeah. um and this is where it's the, the one of the nice things about seagrass and restoration one of the nice things and one of the most challenging things is that we have to rely on volunteers for this work because all of the seed collection that we do is by hand it's hugely intensive it's a huge number of yeah. our people this is hours not something are required you can automate. no no not yet people are working on it and there's some right. really cool Aaron is Aaron robots. here Aaron might be able to fix it for you yeah <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that um, yeah so we are looking at trying to mechanize parts of the process but at the moment we are reliant on volunteers to help collect seed and then also help sow that seed back um, so if that's the UK picture, what's the nature of the work you're trying to expand in the rest of the world? So elsewhere, I mean, we're, we, we're not going to be that kind of fly-in, fly-out type researcher. And Project Seagrass is founded on science. We, are, we all have a background of science. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that we do work is that we will provide technical advice to communities, NGOs, small community groups on the ground who are close to a home meadow or who recognize that there's a problem. And we've been working in this way across Southeast Asia um, recently in a, a, a big project and just helping build capacity so that these local organizations can um, 
provide an evidence base. So it's going through the whole, how do we collect data? How do we collect robust data? And how do we analyze that data? And then how do we present that data as an argument to policymakers um, or natural resource managers to firstly show that there is a problem here right. um, or show that people are this reliant on this habitat? Right. And you've got, there's an app, isn't there? There's an app, yes. And of course there's an app. Uh, yeah. It's 2024. Yeah. yeah. Um, our app is called Seagrass Spotter, yep. um, and this app, it's, it's so cool. Um, so, and it's genuinely useful for people to use this app. Right. So um, you can use it anywhere across the globe. You download it, you take a georeference photograph of a patch of seagrass, um, upload that photograph. And, the, and the, the rationale behind this is you're trying to map. Yeah. So we need All, to map. We, we need, need to, to know map. more yeah, about where yeah. the We need is. to know where it is and we need help. So it's very widespread, but because it's patchy across its range, it's difficult to map. Yep. And so when you're thinking about any kind of, like the, the juggernaut of credits, it's moving and we are moving that way. But we can't put values on um, things that we don't know and we don't know where it is. And so this is a tool that is helping plug that gap. We're working with lots of tech companies at the moment on um, trying to identify seagrass from space right. okay. uh, through satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. And so part of Spotter also is doing that ground truth thing. I think we're quite far away from being able to do that because yeah. it's really difficult to differentiate between all the different grease stuff in, yeah, yeah. in the sea. Anyone here who's good at that kind of stuff, please <laughs> come and talk to Leanne. Yeah. And also, you know, in the, in the U, it might be easier in the Med where you've got clear waters. Um, in the UK where you've got turbid waters and you've got massive tidal ranges, yep. it's still incredibly challenging. We need to know where it is and we need to know where change is happening. And so Seagrass Spotter is a citizen science tool where anyone can be involved and contribute. Um, so um, we're, we're going to come to what, what your ask is to everybody here. <laughs> but I, I just wanted to ask uh, a little bit more uh, understand a little bit more about the relationship between water quality and um, and your ability to generate or regenerate uh, uh, damaged seagrass. Yeah. It, 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 it explain what that connection is. So f for too long, water quality has been the elephant in the room, really. Um, it destroyed, poor water quality destroyed vast areas of seagrass in the first place. They caused the damage. Um, yeah. Okay. And then, you know, we had wonderful things like the uh, water quality framework directive and um, there were huge improvements. And so now there are large areas where we could put that. Um, I mean, it's always easier to reinforce something that you've already got rather than start from scratch. Yeah. However, there are also now vast areas that seagrass has got no chance at, as it stands of growing. Like this, the seeds won't germinate, the plants won't survive where water quality is poor. Yep. We've been working um, recently with uh, Blue Marine Foundation and Surface Against Sewage, mm -hmm. which is a really nice collaboration because it's addressing that water quality issue from different perspectives and yep. Yep. really pushing for, we, we need action on that yep. for so many reasons, you know, not just seagrass. Which, which, which I think leads us <laughs> back to, in, in a sense, where um, uh, where we started with with um, with our Sea Shepherd keynote, what can what can people here do? Yeah, I think we're the softer side of, of what people can do, I think and I, I think for us, it's about bringing people on that journey. Yeah, um, and and we're still in a bubble. You know, people don't know what seagrass is. We, there's still a way to go there to get people in. We need people to care. And then when people care, they will act, they'll do things. Um, and so that's the start point with us. We work with local communities, we work with fishers. We have the conversations about why this is important, why it's not there and why we should bring it back for everyone's benefit. Mm -hmm. So I think for anyone that's got an interest, just sharing that interest and bringing other people on the journey yeah. is an incredibly positive thing to do. Um, we've had a really, sorry, slightly not off topic really inspiring day today because this afternoon yeah. we had a takeover by a local I saw, school I, saw, on, I on think our, I saw that on your Insta and it, what it's was that? just heartening so this school had they, they had challenges on different stalls around yeah. change now and one of yeah. them was on ours um, and so a couple of pupils from the school had been researching seagrass okay. and come up with a, a little game for other kids at the conference to come and play basically to learn about seagrass and why it's important 
Um, and that is just, it's super inspiring for me to see that we've done something that has engaged the school, that has engaged their students who are then teaching other kids Amazing. about this important habitat and that's something that we can all do and I'd like that's there's my optimism and hope for the future is they now care and they are going to do something you know they're going to share that um, and you know as a collective we can we need it's going to take a lot of people to solve the seagrass problem and we need communities engaged on the ground to do that and you have I can't think of a better way to have closed this session uh, Leanne, thank you very much indeed for telling us, well, all about seagrass, but also, I think, driving this towards the solutions, which are the young people who are going to get us out of this dreadful mess that the rest of us have caused. So, probably you. you've caused it less than I have, I think, because you're fixing it. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us on our panel about um, oceans and how we protect them. And I, I hope you enjoy the rest of your time at Change Now. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>